Recording in progress. Good morning. Okay. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone who's joined us for this press conference. My name is Isabel de Sola. I'm the director of the Martin Ennels Foundation based in Switzerland. It's my great pleasure to moderate this press conference where we will finally announce the winners, the laureates of the 2022 Martin Ennels Award for Human Rights Defenders at Risk. Just um, before we get started, I'd like to say a quick word about the technicalities. Uh, since we're doing this online, I'm prepared for there to be some glitches, but I hope that won't be the case. There are two language channels, which uh, those of you who are following us can choose from. We have English and French. If you're watching us from the Foundation website, you can switch between languages at the top right of your screen. If you're joining us by Zoom, you can choose a language, 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 a Questions from the media can be posted in the Zoom chat. You can use um, the button for the chat. It's also at the bottom of your screen. Just type your question and let us know who it's for and what organization you're from. So hopefully that's all the uh, technical details I wanted to share and let's get started. Uh, this is the 29th time that the Martin Ennals Award is celebrated. And our theme this year is about finding inspiration. We've come to know the, 22, the 2022 laureates over the past few months, and we've, we've admired them um, as strategic thinkers, as strategists, as social entrepreneurs. We've admired how they're builders, and how their examples and the charisma that they brought to their work moved many others to join their cause. They move us and inspire us to continue pushing for human rights. I'm joined today by the laureates themselves and their representatives, and we're going to hear from them in a moment. I'm also joined by Hans Tolan, founder of the award and chair of the award jury, as well as Philippe Cura, the president of the foundation board. Hans will help me introduce the first laureate in a moment. Um, the planned remarks should last only about 30 minutes, and then we will address questions from the chat. So um, Hans, please, over to you for a word about the jury and our first laureate. Thank you very much, Isabel. It's really a great pleasure to be here, almost 30 years now. Um, we could never have thought that in the beginning when we started, which was mostly meant to uh, honor our dear friend and important human rights defender, Martin Annals. Soon we discovered that it was more important to look forward and we started to focus on human rights offenders that are often at risk. Um, then we did something else after a few years, which was we created a separate independent jury composed of human rights organizations. Uh, note organizations, not individuals. Of course, organizations have to send an individual to the meetings, but it is the organizations that are in the jury, and these are 10 of them. You can find all 10 of them in the press kit, lower down. Uh, it includes basically all the important human rights organizations, which gives, of course, a tremendous boost to the whole thing in terms of research, outreach, etc. 
And I'm very grateful for all these organizations to do this tremendous collaborative uh, effort, which helps the human rights defenders, I think. Um, we had this year, or last year, we had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 56 uh, applications that were accepted. There were more, but some of them were not complete. Um, out of those 56, after a long process of with discussion, etc., among the jury members, we came to the conclusion that there are three uh, people that deserve this year to be the laureate. And I'm telling you this in particular, laureate, no longer finalist. We had a system by which we, in the last years, by which we selected three finalists, and out of those finalists, we choose later one laureate. Luckily, uh, we have now all agreed that that system can be abandoned, so as from this year on, all three are equal laureates. And the laureates of this year really uh, stand out and are, of course, and they're from different continents, but there's one thing that connects them all. There is, that is their strength. They are galvanizing the human rights movement around them, not just themselves, but inspiring others. They're all very courageous. Two of them ended up in jail. That is very unfortunate, of course. Um, but we owe it to them to try and defend them as much as we can. So uh, with that, I would like to perhaps introduce the first one, uh, which is a journalist from Vietnam, Trang, uh, who has been probably the most outspoken journalist, blogger, and organizer of the media in that country, and she has paid a heavy price. She has been sentenced to nine years in jail, uh, and unfortunately, therefore, she cannot be with us. But uh, I think uh, one of her closest friends and advisors and who cooperates with her all the time is with us, and I'm very happy to give the floor to, sorry, I have to long. We are allowed to say long, it is a bit longer name, and I hope very much that you will be able to give us more insight into this very impressive personality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hans Thorlen. I'm deeply honored to represent my mentor and my best friend, Pham Dan Chang, today in this event. Well, mostly, I would like to thank the jury, the Martin Annals Foundation, and the city of Geneva for recognizing and honoring Dan Chang. Almost exactly eight years ago, Duan Trang landed in Geneva for the first time in her life to attend the UBR hearing on Vietnam, to meet with representatives from the United Nations and human rights organizations, and to advocate for human rights and democracy in a country that she loves very much. I had the privilege of accompanying her during that trip, and now she is honored by the human rights community in the city of Geneva. She should be able to be here today with us, not in prison and not within nine years imprisonment, sentenced last December with absolutely no hope of overturning the verdict. She is currently being jailed in Hanoi, suffering from severe illnesses, without immediate medical attention, without legal representation, and without family visitation. Before being jailed, Duan Chang was one of the most hunted activists in Vietnam, and she was constantly abducted by the police, being beaten up badly on occasions, resulting in her serious lack injuries and sustaining partial disability. Since her return to Vietnam in 2015, she was constantly on the run every two weeks or two months and lived in nearly a hundred different places across the country. Duan Chang's story represents the state of human rights in Vietnam. You probably often hear fancy words about Vietnam today as a rising star, an Asian tiger, or a tourist destination. Some of that may ring true, but the other side of the country is ugly. We are a not free country according to Freedom House. We are ranked at the bottom 
of the Press Freedom Index by Reporters Without Borders. Only better than Eritrea, North Korea, Turkmenistan, China, and Djibouti. And we are having more than 200 prisoners of conscience, Don Chang included. The authoritarian regime in Vietnam, led by the Communist Party, has given no space for citizens to participate in politics meaningfully. Free and fair elections cannot be found anywhere, making Vietnam a smaller version of authoritarian China. And that is why Duan Trang had to fight. Duan Trang's story is the prime example of how we can empower others through kindness, encouragement, and modeling. She writes articles and books she teaches, she founded independent newspapers and publishing houses. Her kindness touches people's hearts. Her encouragement lifts people up and her modeling inspires other people to follow. She has become the change she wanted to see in the world. And with that, it is so obvious that she is one of the most influential journalists and activists that we have had in Vietnam since the end of the Vietnam War. The Martin Anno Award that she receives today is a strong and clear message to the Vietnamese authoritarian governments, and more importantly, to the Vietnamese people, that what she's been doing is right, and the international community is standing by her. It's true that we are having a democracy retreat around the world. We are also witnessing major setbacks in human rights developments in Vietnam, making 2021 probably the worst year since 2000. But people like Abdul Hadi Ankawa, Dr. Dao Da Da Dialo, and Duan Trang represent hope for a better future. And there is hope for a democratic future for Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you, Long, for those strong statements. Um, thank you for being here on behalf of Trang to tell us more about her. We admire her greatly. I think that she leaves a very strong legacy behind her. Um, three or four organizations that she began, some of them together with you, are still uh, plugging strong. And we hope that this award does have an impact on her well being now that she's incarcerated. Let me turn to Let me turn to the second laureate, um, who I have the honor to introduce in Burkina Faso, Dr. Dauda Diallo, who will, I'll invite to speak in a moment. Uh, we're very lucky to have Dr. Diallo actually on the line with us live today. Many of our laureates and winners uh, find themselves like Trang in, in jail, but Dr. Diallo is joining us here live. He is a pharmacist turned activist working in his country in the context of a civil war to conduct documentation of human rights violations. Dr. Dauda, over to you. Okay. Uh, merci. Uh, merci Thank you uh, for, for the organization to let me uh, speak here. I'm a medical professional who is very involved in humanitarian work through the, my role as human rights defender. Uh, my name is uh, Dauda Diallo. I am professional, medical professional and I defend human rights. I was always dedicated to over 20 years of my life to defend human rights in several organizations. I've always been a, a leader of, uh, in my school and I was always uh, defending uh, people. And I have to say that Today, 
maybe 2,000 million people displaced and a lot of school closed and everybody is controlled through a non-professional army. It's very difficult for Burkina Faso. And in January uh, 2019, we had a large mass massacre in in stigmatization in the greatest uh, region, military region for, uh, near from Gadugu. And in this massacre, we um, we 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 called all cultural organization and human rights protection and person to create the collective uh, CESS collective against impunity and stigmatization of community. It's to base about uh, human uh, peace about based on human rights, and since then we had a lot a big in. Packed. We had more than documented, we could document um, over a thousand cases of summary and extrajudicial executions. We could help also more than 100 persons who disappeared, forced and forced disappearances. And we have uh, helped to that stigmatization is accepted as a, a fact in our country and we worked with the organization inter international organization like ICRC, uh, HRV and, and so on but with this problem we have is we have to say we have a really a lot of of um, of uh, um, repression, we are. I I cannot be at home every day. My home was was um, um, but I am I still stay determined to to fight because I have the support of my family and my friends, and it's also really nice. To see that I can help victims of a burglary, uh, um, uh, victims of, of violences, and today to have this prize is really a honor for me and for my um, my uh, collaborate my friends. It it gives me a better capacity to work for the republic and to really to. To, to make disappear all time kind of discrimination. And I thank the Martin Ennals Awards too. And I, I will be, I will, uh, I thank you very much, much for this award. Thank you so much for your remarks. Um, we had a couple of technical glitches while you were speaking. Let me just make sure that everything is okay for my, um, my volume, Hans, can you hear me okay? Yeah, all right. Thanks everyone for your patience with some of the technical glitches online. Um, Dr. Diallo, it's us who thanks you. Um, let this award shine some visibility on those 1000 cases that you together with the colleagues, colleagues from CISC have documented so far. Let this award bring more peace to Burkina Faso as well, and justice for those victims. Uh, so congratulations to you. And let me then ask Hans to introduce our third laureate. Thank you very much, Isabel. Yes, it is indeed a very great pleasure. Um, the third laureate comes from Bahrain, and it is an enormously impressive person who stood at the cradle of the whole human rights movement there. Uh, in fact, he came back from fairly safe Denmark out of his own free will during the Arab Spring to lead the peaceful protest. Uh, but that cost him dearly and he ended up in jail uh, with a life sentence. 
Uh, I think his uh, birthday is coming up in April. Um, and unfortunately, you will have to spend it behind bars. He is an impressive person in terms of inspiring others, um, creating organizations, and also individuals, including his own family. Uh, his two daughters, Zainab and Mariam, are both active in human rights. And I'm very, very glad to have one of the family, Mariam, here to tell us more about the struggle and the work of her father. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hans. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I'd like to say, I mean, as, same as the other laureates as well, um, it's impossible to do justice to my father's work in the time that we have allocated during this press conference, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, my father dedicated his life to his work. He believes so strongly in human rights and freedoms that he has paid um, the price for it over and over and over again throughout his life, whether it was exile or beatings or imprisonment and torture. Um, one of the things that I'm very proud of is the way that my father worked was very much about inspiring others. It was about creating space for people to receive and, and get the tools and skills that they need to fight for their own rights, for their own freedom. So even when he created the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, it wasn't about him fighting for the rights of others only. It was about creating the space where people can fight for their own rights. And in doing so, we saw so many of the people that he worked with, that he trained, that he supported, become uh, part of the leaders, the people who are at the forefront of the protests during the uprising in 2011. And you can see the impact that it has had through, you know, on different generations and through the time um, of people who have risen up, who have become part of organizations, who have worked both inside Bahrain and abroad. And the other part that I think is, um, you know, worth mentioning also about my father's work is how it's, you know, how he worked beyond the borders of Bahrain. It was extremely important for him that we connected the movement in Bahrain, the work that we were doing in Bahrain, that he was doing in Bahrain, to the movement and work that others were doing in the region, all the way from what the Western Sahara to uh, Iran and Iraq and other places across the region. My father worked very hard to try and connect movements and to do human rights trainings and to work with people. And one of the things that I hold so proud and dear to, to, to me during you know, uh, the work that I've done over the past 10 years is the amount of people that I have met who have told me that they are human rights defenders because of my father, because my father met with them, talked to them about human rights and got them to become active as well, um, or that they were inspired by his work. Um, I think it's important to mention that, you know, my father is serving a life sentence right now in Bahrain that, you know, come April, he'll have been in prison for 11 years um, so far, and he'll be turning 61 as well. He's missed the birth of three of his grandchildren during that time. And there are some things that, you know, when we talk about human rights, generally, we talk about the torture, the imprisonment. We don't talk about the things that are never going to be compensated. The time lost with family members, the, the ruining or the destruction of memories, of relationships, of connectivity, and also what comes beyond the imprisonment. After my father is hopefully released, um, the amount of rehabilitation he'll need to go through because of the torture he will be, he was subjected to, the way that he'll need to reconnect and become part of society again. And those are things I think that as a human rights community, we also need to pay more attention to to as well. Um, we've been working on trying to get my father out of prison for 10 years now. Um, but I want to mention that also that there are tens of thousands of political prisoners and prisoners of conscience, not just in Bahrain, but around the region and around the world who also need to be released. We've seen, you know, time and time again that the situation is getting worse. It's getting worse in Bahrain. It's getting worse in places like Saudi, Yemen, the occupation of Palestine in, in Egypt, in Sudan, in Iraq. And I can go on and on with the list. Um, and the region more than ever needs their human rights defenders. We need these people to be outside of prison, to be to be able to come back from exile, to do the work that is necessary to create a better future for future generations. And as long as civil society continues to be struck down upon, the long, the more we see you know, human rights defenders uh, being forced into exile, not being able to live in their own countries, the less likely it is that we can build better futures for future generations in our countries. And finally, I wanted to mention 
um, you know, it's it's um, we're very grateful for the light that you know the Martin Ennals Award sheds on my father's on my father's case. And I also want, I hope it sheds light on the failure of the European Union in protecting human rights defenders. My father is an EU citizen. Uh, the EU has spoken time and time again about the importance of protection of human rights defenders, or the importance of human rights and freedoms. But unfortunately, we've also seen time and time again that business has, has taken priority over human rights, that more often than not, uh, the EU is willing to do business as usual with oppressive regimes, be it selling arms to Egypt or doing business with Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I really hope we can get to a point where we raise enough pressure where we hold up a mirror to the European Union, to the West more generally, where we show how, you know, you can't just talk about the importance of human rights and freedoms, you need to actually implement it. You need to actually, when you talk about the importance of human rights defenders and civil society space, actually do the work that is required to protect those spaces, to protect those people who are putting themselves on the line for human rights and for freedoms. Um, and so I really hope that we can we can do that moving forward. And I look forward to working with the other laureates and with the Martin Ennals team um, to try and raise, you know, shed light and, and raise attention not only to the plight of, you know, the laureates today, but the thousands of prisoners of conscience across the world and the role that we all play and especially governments play in, in trying to get them out or lack thereof, unfortunately. Thank you. Congratulations, Mariam. Thank you for those strong words and reminders as well. Congratulations to you and your sister and your entire family for this recognition, I think, of your father's legacy, which you have continued as well. Um, we won't forget. So we admire Abdul Hadi's contributions in Bahrain, but across the region, he was one of the early movers, one of the pioneers of, of the movement in the Gulf region for human rights. And, um, you know, we won't rest until we get some results. So congratulations again to you and to the three laureates. I'd like to uh, pass the floor to Philippe Cura, the president of the foundation, for some announcements about our ceremony. And from there, we'll open up the floor to questions of which we have many. Thank you, Philippe. Merci, Isabelle. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Thank you, Isabelle. Hello. Yeah, I, I will speak French. First, I would uh, felicit, uh, congratulate the laureates. Uh, once more, the jury has chose three remarkable persons who reinforce our work and is, is the whole humanity is concerned. And also the engagement of the laureates and all everybody who wants to protect the, the human rights will be beneficial. It's our rights and our freedom from all people that our laureates defend, and we have to thank them. Every year, the foundation and the and Geneva creates a, a, a ceremony to to celebrate this laureate. Two years ago, we had we are lucky to have our ceremony just before the the COVID and the, the measures was take, taken. Last year, we had to organize a, only a virtual ceremony, but in 22, we would like to come back to a real ceremony to honor and to, to see the people really and to put the, transmit, the ceremony online to, to uh, share with all the world. In this situation, we know we don't, we are not sure that our laureates and their representatives could come to Geneva in the 10th of February 22. It will be the same for the members of the jury of the member of the Martin Ennals Foundation. With the, also with Geneva and our laureate, we decided to report the ceremony to, to later. And I can confirm today that the ceremony will take place the 2nd of June 22. A lot of organizations and human rights defenders have new means to 
to uh, continue their work and we have to do the same. We will offer to our laureates a, a good ceremony who honors their, their work and really honors the sacrifices they accept to take over for continuing their work. In the actual situation, we are really concentrated on, on these activists, on human rights and on liberties in all the world. Some restrictions are le le legitimate, but others are not. But it's always more contested. And this situation creates always, always more tension and it shows the base the, the bad instincts of, of human. But we want to go on the top and to honor these people and to thank them. We want to offer to our public and to our laureates really a good time together with the jury members, with the members of the Martin Ennels Foundation and also from the representatives to the uh, um, to our, from Switzerland and Geneva. And we think we can do it the two, the 2nd of June 22 in Geneva. And we, we are looking forward to welcoming you in a ceremony where we'll really put us together physically. Uh, Geneva and our partner uh, has, is, our, is partner of Martin Eller Foundation. And we thank them that we for this basis politic basis of our uh, life thank you for the interpreter and it's really important that we can um, understand ours together yes uh, that makes it official that our ceremony has been postponed the 2022 ceremony is postponed to the 2nd of june please mark your calendars all of those all, all those of you who've joined us today because um, we look forward to welcoming everyone at that date in person if conditions allow. And now um, we're ahead of time. We have about 15 minutes or 13 minutes for a Q&A and I have several questions lined up. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna launch um, one question for each of the laureates or their representatives and then we'll do another round. Um, and I hope to hear from each of the laureates or their representatives for about two minutes so that we can do two rounds of questions. So the first question I have. Forgive me, can you hear me now? It's back? Great. <laughs> A question for Long regarding Vietnam's candidacy to be part of the Council UN Human Rights Council in 2023. How is that congruent with Vietnam's political system and what is your opinion on that given human rights records in Vietnam? I have a question for Dr. Diallo as well in Burkina Faso. There are rumors it's been reported that the government is opening talks with different factions from the Islamic groups that are fighting for control in Burkina Faso. Do you believe that this will advance progress towards peace in your country, or do you see that as a setback? A question for Mariam regarding Abdul Hadi, her father's well being. This is a question from. I'll tell you the Swiss journalist, Laurent Sierra from ATS, Swiss Wire Agency. Do you fear that there will be reprisals and even worse treatment of your father after this award? Or do you believe that will improve their condition? And a a follow-up question from an anonymous um, submitter is why has your father not been released? Recently, he requested clemency for his uh, release to house arrest. What is stopping them? So two minutes or three min minutes to each of our laureates, uh, beginning with Long. Thank you, Isabel, and thank you for the question. And um, I uh, would like to say that um, the Vietnamese government, the Communist Party of Vietnam, have always been trying very, very hard to look good in the international stage. 
trying to legitimize their authoritarian rule. And despite the fact that there are human rights records here at home are very poor. And um, I have great respect for the, the UN uh, system. And throughout my 10 years of activism and throughout more than 10 years of activism that Chang has um, gone through, we have um, benefited a lot and we appreciate very much the United Nations human rights mechanism. But it would be a slap on the face of all Vietnamese human rights defenders, all Vietnamese victims of injustice, and to all human rights defenders around the world. If an authoritarian, a cruel authoritarian regime like Vietnam being in the Human Rights Council of the United Nations, um, I understand and I'm aware that there is limitations to the UN system. And I think that that, should, that something should be done to prevent authoritarian regime such as China and Vietnam from influencing and from manipulating the United Nations human rights system. And I hope that liberal democracies in the world and all those of us who are human rights defenders around the world will do our very best to prevent China and Vietnam from destroying the very system that we are relying on. Thank you. Thank you, Long, for your clear reply. Let me turn to Dr. Diallo for his remarks. Okay. Uh, merci. Uh, if you dire Thank que... you. I have to say that my work with my col colleagues, my work is uh, for free to work for freedom in our country and and human with human rights. And I think that with this uh, prize, the international prize, which is an honor for us, and he would give you give us credibility and give us uh, reinforcement for our work, for the dialogues and the mediation between the communities to uh, to help. Uh, the, the people in Burkina Faso, we are really in an extreme situation. For me, it will help the, our strengths, our efforts for to construct a real, real peace. And it will help also everybody in, Sukina, in Burkina Faso to help uh, to to help us and to to uh, help all the people in Burkina Faso. Let me turn to Marion for her response. Je... Thank you. Um, so to answer the first question, I think that you know it's really difficult to know with with the Bahraini regime. Pretty much anything can happen, right? Um, we've seen time and time again um, actions of reprisals. We've seen family members of human rights defenders getting arrested and beaten and or tortured because of their activism in exile. And so it's really difficult to know what to expect. Um, it is possible that there will be acts of reprisals against my father. But the idea is that we have to press on despite uh, what the government, uh, what the regime in Bahrain does. Um, my father has been in prison for ele almost 11 years now. And despite that, he's continued his activism from within his prison cell. He's gone on multiple hunger strikes, even when they stripped him of all the tools that he had. He used the last tool that he had um, to, to protest, to continue his activism, and that was his own body. And so he's been on multiple hunger strikes to protest a number of things, including the torture and abuse of other prisoners um, that he could hear from his prison cell. And so he will continue his activism, whether he receives the support that he should get uh, internationally or not. And so I think uh, what the least that we can do abroad is to support his activism as well as the activism of so many others. 
Um, to answer the second question, um, I want to make clear that my father hasn't requested clemency. Uh, it's a very different um, situation. It's actually called an alternative punishment law that allows for people to uh, be outside of prison, but to be at home, but still under surveillance and wearing an ankle bracelet and so on. Uh, so it's not clemency. Uh, my father shouldn't be in prison to begin with um, at all. So he should be released. And he had conditions also. He said that um, even that despite requesting um, being released, you know, under the, the alternative punishment law that it has to come with a dignified release. Um, so he would not in any way apologize for his activism, for the work that he's done in order to be released, which is something that they have asked him if he'd be willing to do before, to apologize to the, the monarch of Bahrain who, you know, announced himself king um, in 2001, um, and or if he would be willing to give up his Bahraini citizenship, which he refused to do. I, the one thing that I did want to mention in, in you know, addition to that, I think, because also the question of the UN came up, I think, you know, our systems are very broken when it comes to human rights institu institutions. I think part of the reason we're seeing the decline in human rights, not just in places like Bahrain and, and Yemen and Syria and so on, but also in places like Denmark and like Europe and like the United States and other places, is because we don't have strong international mechanisms for accountability and for the protection of human rights, in my opinion. And I think it's only when we work on strengthening um, those institutions, those mechanisms to actually be fair, to be equal, are we actually going to see it, them make a difference in the international sphere? Um, when we're talking about, you know, the equal implementation of human rights and accountability, it has to apply to everyone. That means it has to apply to, to governments like the United States government that has committed war crimes in other countries. It has to apply to EU countries that commit human rights abuses against refugees, for example. And it has to apply to governments like Saudi Arabia and Bahrain who commit human rights abuses on a daily basis. There cannot be a system of favoring and politicized, um, politicized uh, transparency or accountability when it comes to human rights and, and the protection of human rights defenders and civil society. I think only then will we see you know, better human rights, internationally speaking, um, and better mechanisms for the protection of civil society, human rights defenders around the world, and generally democracy as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you for those uh, clear statements. And I'm afraid actually that we are at the end of our press conference. Um, we ended up running out of time for a second round of questions. Um, but we're very grateful to all of you for the time that you've spent with us this morning and especially to the laureates or their representatives um, for sharing your stories, for telling us how it feels, um, your fears and also your hopes for this next year. Please receive a heartfelt congratulations from all of us at the Martin Ennals Foundation. And before we conclude, I'd, I'd also very much like to thank our supporters and our donors. Um, we couldn't do this without the very precious help of the city of Geneva, who unfortunately didn't join us for the press conference, but who are our closest partner in the ceremony celebration, as well as the Confederation, the Canton of Geneva, private foundations, our 10 jury members, our wonderful board, Hans, of course, who's here with us, and the magnificent um, interpretation that we've had this morning. Thank you, Irene, and to the superb technical team behind this Zoom, uh, which had minimal glitches. <laughs> Thanks everyone for your patience and your participation. Mark your calendars. June 2nd, 2022 in Geneva and online for the ceremony. And please help us to get the word out about these three amazing defenders, Fan Don Trang, Dr. Dauda Diallo, and Abdulhadi Al-Kawaja and his entire family. Let's really celebrate them over the next months. So bravo and have a wonderful rest of day.